Protozoa is the nematodes, the bacteria, the fungi, uh, the rot, the rotifers, the, the, uh, all of these creatures decompose soil, break it down and make it plant soluble. Those we're trying to grow. And so in composting, what we do is kill the bad guys and make the good guys live really well. So that's, that's the deal. Now there's three types of composting. There's thermocomposting, there's static composting, and there's vermicomposting, which is worm composting. These are the three types of composting. They're all very good. There isn't a right way and a wrong way. There is your way, that's the deal. So you do whatever you like to do best, but it's very essential that you do the composting process. <clears throat> Thermal composting, we're going to cover first. It is all about heat. That's why they call it thermal. It's all about heat. Now, um, when, you, when you look at these piles, you can see there's heat coming off of them. And when I, do my, uh, when I do my thermal composting, and that's the choice that I have made to do thermal composting because of some advantages, the core temperature is 165 degrees, and it kills all the pathogens, okay? So when you look at these piles, you know heat's coming off of them because they are composting, and you see people turning them. This is the way I do it with a tractor. This is not my tractor, but this, this is the way I do it. I, I put them all in a pile, and then when, it, when the core temperature reaches 165 degrees, I, I turn them, and I just flip it over, and I'll explain that to you. Thermal composting kills all weed seeds in, and all seeds because of the temperature rise. So you don't have to, when you use that product, you don't have to worry about anything sprouting after you use it. It kills all human pathogens, all path, uh, plant pathogens. It kills all root feeding nematodes, but the good ones live. That's a god thing. The good guys live, the bad guys die because of the temper, temperature differential. The good nematodes live to 180 degrees, the bad ones die at 131 degrees. Okay? So the bad protozoan, they, uh, they die and the good ones live. At 131 degrees, all the bad protozoans, the ciliates and stuff, they all die. And the good guys all live. That's a God thing, guys. God set this up and wants we cooperate with him and to work better. And then it kills all insect pests. So once you get through with it, if you, say for instance, you had a bunch of tomatoes and they had all kinds of aphids on it, or your, your peppers, and you had all kinds of aphids on it, when you put it in your compost pile and you go through your heat process, it kills them all dead, so you don't have to worry about them. So uh, it's a very good process. Some people do the thermal composting and then they do a vermicomposting with the thermal compost. So they thermal compost it, heat it up, cook it, kill all the, all the bad guys, the weeds and everything, and then they put it in their worm beds. And um, that really is probably the ideal. Um, as long as the temperature gets above 131 for three days, all the bad guys are dead, or above 150 for two days, all the bad guys die, or 165 for one day, all the bad guys die. But the whole pile does not heat up. And that is the reason why you have to turn a thermal compost pile. Because the core temperature is 160 degrees, the next one around is 140, and the outside is 85. So what you have to do is take the outside, put it on the inside, and you flip it. And so that's, that's the thermal composting process. Now how many times do you have to turn a thermal compost? Well, it all depends three times if you only have plant material. If you use animal products, you have to do it five times. Why? Because the pathogens, you have to be really, really careful. If you're using cow manure, chicken manure, any of those. Now, let me make this suggestion to you. If you have cow manure, and it, had, it came from a cow that had, that had, um, mad cow disease, how much temperature is it going to take to kill it? Does anybody know? At 3,000 degrees, it doesn't kill it. So, you know, we're, we've been told that toward the last days, there's not going to be any safety in using any animal products. You have to be really, really careful when you put animal products. I choose not to do that. Uh, I choose not to put animal products in my compost because I'm growing vegan organic with no fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. 
So it's an entirely veganic system. So uh, five times you have to be real careful. Now if you use, well, we'll go on to that. When do you know when to turn your compost pile? Well, when the temperature, of the core temperature reaches 160 to 165, then you turn it. That's as simple as that. You take a thermometer, this is a three foot long thermometer, and you just stick it in the pile, and you look and see what temperature it is. Once it hits 160, 165 degrees, then it's time to turn it. All right? How long does it take to fully compost? Well, it depends on the material used and the percentages of that material used. Let me show you this. This is, if you use 25% high nitrogen foods, 30% green, and 45% woody, it took them, well, here it is starting to go out, get, getting ready at 44 days. Okay? Now, these, this little graph is when the temperature rises. It hit 160, they turned it, it cooled down. Then it hit 160, they turned it, it cooled down. It hit 160, they turned it, it cooled down. It hit 160, they turned it, it cooled down. And then that one they didn't turn, though it reached that temperature and then just dropped. So, now how long did it take? Now if you were using 25% nitrogen material, it took them three days to reach 160 degrees. Now watch what happens if you use 10%, all right? Now at 10%, it took them uh, seven, I think six or seven days before it hit the temperature. So the higher the nitrogen, the quicker it goes. And it took a lot longer to, to resume back to ambient temperature. Now, when you, when you he, they only turned this pile twice. You see, they only turned it twice, and that's all they needed to. And you've got to maintain 50% moisture level in it. They were using 10% high, 30% green, and 60% woody. There's a, there's a reason why you would change this formula here, and I'll cover that in just a moment. All right, so how much of each should you use? Well, you can go the 25% nitrogen or 10% nitrogen. In the green, uh, the green you can go from 10 to 40%, and the woody 35 to 65%. Now, this can change. It's not absolutely scientifically, it has to be this way. And I'll tell you why. Uh, as we go through this, you'll see. Now, when you went to 25%, they couldn't use that compost for six to eight weeks. But if you go 10% nitrogen, it took them three months before they could start using it. So if you really want to get this done fast, but you're going to work a lot harder and you're going to turn a lot more, go to the 25%. If you allow it to go above 165, then you're in danger of making it go anaerobic. It starts using up all the oxygen real, real fast, and it produces alcohol, and it will ignite at 180 degrees. Now, uh, I bought some ground-up trees, branches, leaves, all that kind of stuff. I bought it from a company in Gainesville. And um, they were late. So I called them up and said, what's going on? Well, one of our piles com spontaneously combusted, and we can't put it out. It's probably going to be a day or two before we can get to you. And they fought that for three days. They could not put it out. Because they had allowed it to go anaerobic. It went above. They didn't turn it at 160, 65 degrees. It suddenly burst into flames because it was producing alcohol. When it hits 180 degrees, it will automatically go. So you, if you do thermal composting, you have to be aware of, of what you're doing. You have to actually do something. You can't say, ah, oh, in a few days I'll get to it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Well, as soon as it hits 160, you flip it. 160, you flip it. I don't care what you're doing, you have to stop and do it. You have no choice. So. If you go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, you better go out at 6 o'clock in the morning, put your temperature thermometer in there, and see what that, if it says 180, you've got to flip it. You've got to turn it all upside down and flip it inside out. And uh, that's the deal about thermal composting. You have to watch it. If it, you don't go, you don't set these piles up and go on vacation, because they will cook themselves and start a fire on your property. That's what they'll do. That's the, that's the whole process. Okay. Now, high nitrogen material. You can use uh, the high nitrogen material would be legumes if no fertilizer is used in the growing. 
and then it's considered a high nitrogen food. If somebody ever puts fertilizer on a lagoon in a field, it suddenly quits doing nitrogen fixation. We covered that a couple lessons ago. And they return to a 30 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Normal plants like greens would be. And so you would count that as a green product. But if you could pull the roots up and you see it has nitrogen fixing nodules on the root system, then that is a high nitrogen food, 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So that is in the ballpark actually a little bit more potent than manure. And that is a perfect thing to use. Any, any part of the lagoon plant, just put it in there. All right? Then we have the manures. Now one thing you have to understand is if you go to a commercial farm and you get your manure, it is chock full of all kinds of nasty stuff that you don't want in your garden. It's got antibiotics. They're constantly feeding them antibiotics so they'll put on weight. And when they do that, it kills all your microbiology in your soil. You do not want commercial farm stuff. You, if you go to an organic farm, yes. If you go to a horse farm, don't get any that if, if they have a given the, the horses a worm medication, you don't use that manure for three days afterwards because that that will kill all your microbes. So you go there and say, hey, have you done any worm injections lately? And if they say no, then you can use all that horse manure you want. Okay? And it's 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. If it has no bedding with it, if it has bedding with it, it's 20 to 1. It's not quite as high. So you would have to use more of it. Anytime you have bedding material in it, you have to reduce the amount of percentages. In other words, say for instance, a lot of people use bucket methods. They have 10 buckets here. All right? And they got, say they have uh, chicken manure with bedding in it. You have a chicken, you have your chicken farms. You have chicken manure with your bedding in it. Well, you're going to figure that to be 20 to 1. So you're going you're gonna to maybe use three five-gallon buckets in your composting in, in that process. Okay? So the next thing are seeds and grains. And that's what I use. I go to the farmer's co-op and I buy, I buy crack corn. Crack corn is higher in nitrogen than manure. Uh, if you use any grains, any flowers, anything that comes from seed, it is higher than manure. And you can use it. You have to have nitrogen to kick the pile off. Okay? Does that make sense to you? All right. Nitrogen is the key factor in all of this. It starts the heat process. If you had all of your plant material out there and had no nitrogen material, it will not heat. So you have to have nitrogen. It's very important that one of these gets in the pile. Now some people use chemical fertilizer to heat up their pile. It will heat up the pile. Because I've tried it. It will heat up the pile, but it kills your microbes. You'd have to re-inject your microbes. Okay? Now green plant material is any material that you would take out of the garden. Now let me ask you this. Is hay green plant material? Yeah. It okay, it doesn't look green to you, but it was. It, it's true. It is green. Hay is green plant material. Now, green plant material has a higher nitrogen ratio than brown woody. It's a 30 to 1. Now, what they do is they cut the grass, the, uh, the hay, they cut it green, and they lay it in the field and let it dry in the sun. It turns it brown, but it's the same structure as if it was cut green. It's just like dehydrating food in the dehydrator. It still retains all of the nutrients, all the nitrogen, exactly the same way. So what you would do, if, if you were cleaning out your garden, but you didn't want to make your pile till next week, just lay it all flat in the yard and let the sun bake it. And then get, once it all baked it up and browned it, pull it up in a pile, it won't begin to cook until you add the nitrogen. So then bring it all together and, and mix it with your brown woody and your nitrogen, and then it will start cooking. Okay? All right, so green plant material produces, it is a bacterial food. Now we learned that bacterial food makes what kind of nitrogen? You guys. <laughs> you, you guys don't. Nitrates. That feeds weeds. And it feeds garden crops too. But if you had only green plant material, it produces NO3, nitrogen, and it will 
also feed your weeds. If you only had green plant and nitrogen material in your in your pile, you will not you will be growing the best weeds in the in the county. That's why it's very important to have woody substances in your compost pile. Okay. Now, woody uh, material is straw. What's the difference between straw and hay? Does anyone know? Well, it is coarser. Okay. Okay, straw is cut dried in the sun. And hay is cut green. In other words, the, the alfalfa comes up, it heads out, they let it dry out just like fall leaves. And that's 100 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio for hay if it was cut green is 30 to 1. Okay. That's considered hay, it's considered green material, and you can put it in your compost pile and uh, cook it. All right. I'm going to show you an easier way to do all of this in just a moment. Okay, so woody substances create all the fungal foods, and fungal foods produces what kind of nitrogen? Ammonium, NH4. Okay, yesterday I went to a place uh, near Bird's house on 137, they have these huge wood piles. And I'm talking about uh, three times higher than me. Okay? They have been grinding up trees, throwing them in these piles, grinding up trees. And you can go buy this stuff. Okay? I went yesterday and I got a handful of this stuff and I took it back and I have a soil analysis kit, very, very nice kit that I can test all the nutrients. All right, now it's a woody substance. I tried two different types of nitrates, and, uh, NO2 and NO3, and it had nothing in it, absolutely zero. I tried uh, ammonium, I did my ammonium test on it, and it was really loaded with ammonium. So ammonium feeds what types of plants? Main one. Trees, woody plants. If you use a nitrate on your trees, it will kill it dead. Don't use nitrates ever on a tree, okay? It feeds all the perennials, it will feed your, your row crops, and it will, it's, ammonium is poisonous to weeds. So the more woody substance that you put in there, the better you're gonna grow trees. Okay, now, here's where we go with this. Say for instance, you wanna put in a tree orchard, or you wanna put in, you wanna put in some apple trees and orange trees, and you wanna put in some, uh, uh, different kinds of trees, fruit trees, persimmons, and all that kind of stuff. You would want 75% woody, 25% nitrogen. Because you're going to be producing all of this with that pile. You're going to have it full of fungus, and you're going to have, um, it's going to be a fungally dominated pile, and you're going to be producing ammonium, and your trees will grow five feet a year. Now, we proved this. I, I planted four apple trees and four peach trees, and uh, I dug them up because they were in the wrong place. You know, I, was, I did not know this stuff at that time. So I put them between my concrete beds. You remember that? Okay, so I put my apple trees and my peach trees and a persimmon tree, and they were gorgeous. They were growing wonderful. Man got all over me because I cut them down. All right, so, so I, I put them in with 100% woody, and they grew five feet a year. They produced the first year I put them in the ground. They grew all winter, and when they popped, now people don't know this, but your fruit trees will put on roots all winter if you put them in a woody material that's been composted. Those, those roots will go everywhere. Now, what you must understand is this. You have as much biomass below ground as you do above ground. The more roots you have, the more branches you have. Okay, so say for instance, you cut the tree down and you weighed it and weighed a ton. Well, you got a ton of roots under the ground. If you have a 500 pound tree, when you cut it down, you got 500 pounds of roots. So in the winter time, you want it to be in this woody material and it's gonna grow like crazy, these roots, and you're thinking of dormant. It isn't dormant. It's putting out roots everywhere because you put this woody substance in and it's growing and growing and growing. In spring, it'll jump that fast. 
bang, it'll grow so fast it'll scare you. So, whoa, what in the world? You almost can see it grow. You can hear it go crack, crack, crack in the middle of the night. It's like, what happened? Well, it's because we put it in this woody material. It's really important to feed trees what they want. You think of them as a row crop. They are not a row crop. Trees are different. And every species of tree is a little different. We'll go through this some. All right, now make sure your compost pile is 50% moisture, and the minimum size pile is three feet by three feet. Now, this is something you have to keep in mind. A three foot by three foot pile, if you had a three foot by three foot pile in the cage, in, in, in seven or eight weeks, it's only 40% that size. So you combine piles. You know, you, you start maybe, um, a four foot by four foot, 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 you got four of them. You're going to end up with three and then end up with two. Because that's, that's just the way it works. It's going to cook down. Okay? The more green, the, quick, the more cooking it, the cooking it down. Now, you also have to cover it. I, I have mine in windrows because I do a lot more than you would do. But you're supposed to cover it. I haven't covered it. Now, I learned that just recently through this, this uh, class with Dr. Elaine Ingham. She says you should cover them. Uh, it keeps the sun from baking the outside layer and drying it down. It keeps the, the, the rain off of it so it doesn't soak up too much water. You get it perfectly 50% and then you cover it and put it to bed. You do not cover it with plastic. You cover it with something that's permeable. This is what they call Comtex. Comtex is like Gore-Tex for these plants. Okay. Here's another one, context, uh, a little more expensive model. Now, when you grow yours, or when you decide to do yours, I'm going to show you a few different ideas, and then we're going to get to the easier way. We're, doing, we're showing it the hard way. We're going to show you the easy way in just a moment. All right? So there's nothing wrong with this. Trust me, this works really, really well, and I'm not trying to discourage you, but I would do it a different way if I was not a farmer, if I was not larger production than you. If I was going to grow a garden, I would do it differently. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the, this guy built this frame, and then uh, he puts his, he fills up his piles, and you mix it. When you get ready to cook, you don't just keep adding, keep adding, keep adding. You add all the material one time at one day. Okay, so and you mix it up, or you can put it in layers. It really doesn't matter. You want to pack it down in there. So he built this so he can take it apart, and then put the frame over there, and then put the stuff in the frame again. That's what he did. And that's a, a really good idea. All right. Here's another one. Now, he has covers on his, and you should have a cover on it. Here's one with a cover. That thing is $499. It's made out of cedar. Now, these boards come out. You see? These boards come out so you can draw your stuff in, put your boards in as, you, as you're building this pile. And it has a cover on it. Uh, here, here it is, covered. But it's open on the side. You see, it's, you've got to have air going through it. That's the purpose of it. Here's, here's a really a perfect one. Each one of these boards come out. So when he gets ready to build his pile, he's got it covered with uh, polycarbonate panels on the top. And so what he does is when he gets ready to do it, he takes all these out and he throws it in here. And then he puts these panels down uh, as he's filling it up so it's a little easier to work. And then, then he throws it in the next pile and the next pile when he gets through is 40% of the original size. So he just keeps throwing it to the next and throwing it to the next and then he starts his new pile here and then he throws it in the next and throws it in the next. And th that is the preferred method by most compost gardeners. Okay? All right. Now, here is a very unique one. You can't tell this, but they took fencing material and put it in a round thing and put clips on it and then threw the stuff in the top of it. Okay? And you see, they layered it. And that's okay. You can layer it. You can mix it up. It doesn't matter how you put it in there. Just as long as you get those percentages of 10 to 25 percent nitrogen. Okay? So, so they make these, these things, and then they fill them up, and then uh, they stomp on them. All right? And the reason why they stomp on them is so that, you know, you put in some of this, like, tomato uh, bushes or, or anything. They're, they're all apart. You've got these huge air pockets, and they're not touching each other. You want to crush them down so they're touching each other. Okay? So, so he, he's stomping on it, and then he climbs out. He, he, he got on this bucket and jumped in there. He's, he's a young guy. He's not like me. Okay, so, so then they got them all ready, and then they take them apart. They just take their clips off. There are three clips, and then they put it over here, and then they flip it all in there. 
It's a real simple deal. It's cheap. It works. So you don't have to. It doesn't have to be expensive. It works. Some people do the ten bucket method. Okay, and the fact is they do too. This group of people. This is the class I'm taking. She was showing us how to do this with this, uh, with this system, with ten buckets. You take your ten buckets of stuff, throw it in there, and, and she said, it's so easy, you just count your ten buckets. All right, so what happens when you don't turn the pile at the right time? Well, you catch on fire, or you make these bad guys. That's uh, a tin of my seats. This is a bacteria that acts like a fungus. It looks like a fungus. Everybody thinks it's a fungus. When you look at it, it's a bacteria that's growing. Here's another, another. your pile does this. It goes anaerobic, and it, and it produces this. Can you use this? Yes, you can. Brassicas and mustard grow really well on actinomyces. They call it actinobacteria, okay? So mustard and broccoli, I mean mustard and broccoli and uh, cabbages and, uh, and kale grows wonderful on this stuff. So if you mess up a pile, just save it for, your, for those. It will grow nothing else. And your broccoli and your kale will grow really fine in normal compost. Because there is a certain percentage of actinomycetes in all soil. But that's what that is. So don't throw it away. Use it. But it's not what you want. You can take and make compost and grow any, any, any brassica family. You can grow it wonderfully in normal compost. You don't have to have that to grow. But it will grow. So you don't have to throw it away. All right? Now, Static compost is where I really want you to go. Now, I'm going to tell you how this process works. Static means you don't move it. And if you, if I were you, I would do this, and in fact, I'm seriously contemplating it. Okay? Of doing a section of my property in this. Static composting is what Paul does in Back to Eden. He puts it on the ground, about this thick, and, it, and he doesn't go and flip it. But it's chickens do. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a uh, video. Part of this video, <clears throat> actually, let me see. Okay. Now, here's the suggestions. You set up a temporary place in your backyard. Who, who's ever raised chickens? Pat. Okay. No, you guys have. Okay. Who, who? Raise your hands again. Okay. You've raised chickens. 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 Okay. Chickens. They're going to do all your work for you. Now, there's a little bit of uh, reluctance on my part to change anything from veganic to anything else, but I'm going to set up a spot in my, in my property that I'll set up a fence. Now, some of these people, they, they put up permanent fences. I'll show you some of these things. Uh, here's a nice one. Uh, you put that bottom board in, and when you put your, your wood chips in the bottom, then they start decomposing and your, your chickens work it. They just scratch around it, they aerate it for you automatically, they eat all your weed seeds automatically, they, they peck every bug, they eat every single insect, they, oh man, they're wonderful. And they work 12 hours a day for free, okay? And you throw all your, your, your groceries in there that you don't eat, and, and you throw all your garden scraps, and i got plenty of them, trust me, and you throw them in there, and they eat it all. And they don't have to eat any grains. They eat that. They prefer to eat that, actually. Okay? So now they're working this pile and it's composting down all by itself. And when it gets perfectly composted, move your fence over to another area and start a new area and start growing in that. And it's so rich, you'll never fertilize it ever again. And they do it for you automatically. Now, it takes about a year. Each one of these processes, when you go static, it's going to take you about a year to get into full production. You, once you set up your, your chicken pen, and, and, and you, you start growing your chickens in there, and you're really not raising chickens, you're growing your compost. You're growing your soil. So you put it in about, you know, about that much, you know eight, nine inches, put it in pretty heavy, and they'll work through that thing. And I'll show you some on this video. You can make them with, uh, with these uh, pallets. There's all kinds of different ways you can do it. Here's a, a beautiful fence. That would be so pretty you wouldn't want to tear it down. Okay. Now, and keep your deer out, Donna. Okay, so 
This one, uh, they actually covered the top because they had a problem with hooks. Okay? Uh, this, this is just the bare essential. That's not a bad deal. Just make sure you put your bottom board in so none of your stuff comes out. And then just fill it up to the top of the bottom board. Just start throwing your stuff over the fence. And they'll work it for you. And then a year later, take all this down, grow your garden in. Or you don't even have to take it down, grow your garden in. Move your chicken. It, it, to me, it makes sense. They had a problem with hawks, so they put a top on it. All right. Now this guy is going to—he he made it like I'm going to make mine. I'm just going to do it as simple as possible. I'm going to throw it out in the field. Wood chips. You get them for free, folks. They're free. You get one of, with one of these companies that do all the, you know, like Tri County um, Tree Service. Just go to them and say, hey, you, will you bring me your wood chips? Sure. Chipped wood. What you want is like inch, inch squares. In six months, everything below two inches is complete soil. Okay? So throw it out there. This is what I'm going to do because T-posts are cheap. I'm going to take this fencing that goes along with the T-post, put it up. I'm going to put a fence up. And then I'm going to put my chickens in there. I'll put a little house in there at nighttime. I'm going to lure them in and say, come on to bed. I'm going to close you down because I don't want any foxes or coyotes to get them. All right? So I have a friend that's doing this, and it works wonderful. And... Um, and he has a one acre, and this is what he's done. He has one acre that he cross-fenced, and he puts the chickens in this side, and then they work that whole soil. Get, he says they take every single weed. It's gone all by themselves. And he throws his scraps over there, and then the next, and he gardens on this side. And then he opens this gate, he brushes them all in, he closes the gate, and they work that soil, and he's now on this side. All right, does that make sense to you? Okay, none of this shoveling, none of this... Uh, this is a no-brainer, in my opinion. Cross-fence it, build your little house for the chickens, a little go on this side, a little go on that side. Have your garden here, next year work that, flip them back and forth, they get it all aerated for you, beautiful soil, all right? Uh, I'm going to show you two videos that's very important in, uh, to understand this whole process. Now this is static composting, you can do thermal, I'm doing thermal, and thermal composting works wonderful. Is she a pretty child? That's my grandbaby. Okay, so, okay, let's go to, back to Eden. Now. <clears throat> When you look at the incredible landscape on planet Earth, all the different terrains, the varying soil conditions, the awesome water features, oceans, lakes, rivers, streams, the waterfalls, the different climates, the huge amounts of plants and ground covers, the requirements are so varied. Can one fathom how big a project are? Reduce our water use by 95 to 99 your yard waste uh, so plant right in it you know because it's chips and it, uh, dissolved as well as the manure and so on so we had really good luck that way it would not be good in the garden without being decomposed with something else you know that's a common complaint if you use straight horse manure i'll go get some and show you a sample of it Now that's the kind of pile that's on one You can see how there's no manure so you in there. Get it. It's all decomposed. And this is this is gradually rot decomposing also the same way. And as you use it, you'll notice that each year the soil gets better, you know. Especially if you like Paul was saying, where you put down a ground up wood chips type thing and then cover with it, it makes a sustainable program. It's a, it's a recyclable thing, and then, you, of course, the vegetables or the, or the flowers or whatever you have grow. They die for spring winter. You put more on. They, it's just a, it's a circle type thing. Yeah, and it makes you feel kind of good because ecologically it's pretty darn sound, you know. Our culture is so wasteful. And so most people think, well, get rid of these, get rid of this wood chip stuff, get rid of it. You, you, take, you cut stuff in your yard and stuff. One of the things that you probably never know about Paul now is that any any waste out of his garden goes over into the chicken coop or in the chicken bay. And then they eat it and 
Watch it around and then poop. And then they, he brings that back over here and dresses it. Well, I think one of the most beneficial um, parts of a, a garden is to have a, chickens around because there's, there's such, I mean, the eggs are great. But you see, they deal with all your waste, all of your yard waste, the stuff, expired stuff in the garden, my grass clippings, any weeds, all come to the chickens. And those are really nice organic products for them that they eat, and whatever they leave over turns into what we're going to be exposing here in a minute. They're out here all day long just kicking. You can see all those little grooves in here where they they're digging it. And they're excavating, they're constantly picking seeds out, any bug, you kind of thing. So they're always they're working this material. And as you're going to see shortly, I'll tell you, this is, I've never seen compost so nice. This almost, is approach, this almost approaches topsoil. This is such beautiful stuff. Anyway, I'll just show you how easy it is to, to get. Chickens are my soil manufacturing plant. The eggs are just a bonus. there's a soil and that's good you know presumably the soil has been protected and in the meantime it's been breaking down and getting a little bit richer with time but this mulch that is on top is basically organic matter and that's one of the things that we're losing out of our soils around the United States is organic matter organic matter is wonderful it's a it holds the moisture up there it's like a sponge it just holds it there and it just sits there the plant can stick a little root here in the water and sucks it just like a straw about this big around and it just comes up real easy. And, uh, and plus, being in contact with that organic matter, it's got plenty of minerals, plenty of nutrients, uh, lots of nitrogen and all that sort of thing. It's quite interesting. People always ask me, well, what are your soils like if they tested this? Well, I've never tested it. I've already seen where I came from. It's getting so much better that I've just been really happy with my results. I think this is really neat to do soil testing. We were actually able to see that all this stuff, I mean, the soil completely is over the top as far as, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, which is what the plants have always indicated. It's just nice to see that scientifically this, you know, meets the criteria. It's what it looks like. Every year in the same place, I get a higher and better yield because the, the compost is being deposited into the soil via rain and water as a compost tea. And it's just like the soil is the bank. And it's a real descriptive, like compounding interest, just gets better and better and better. And the beauty is, I do nothing. Irrigation, well, the rain does great as it does everything out there. Nature does everything with rain, and so it is here. Now, in the summertime, when I'm planting the seeds out in my garden because it's dry on top, I'll water initially to get them up. But once they're up, I stop watering. You go to plant as you pull in the side, if they're not wet, you want to water. Because you, you know, seeds have to have damp ground just to, to sprout it. And so this, you know, whatever state it's in when you go to plant will indicate whether you need to water or not. Irrigation is, is, a, is a big issue these days, especially with places where there's not much water or places where there's too much. Although we're in Washington, the Evergreen State, um, you know, it's known for having lots of water. Here in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountains, we're getting about 16 to 18 inches of rainy. Um, I want to show you one other thing that's, uh, I'm probably going to come back to this video, but I want to show you what wood chips do, what uh, the benefits, uh, one of the benefits. Um, this guy, this guy lives in an area, oh, this guy that you're going to see, lip testing, 
This guy lives in an area that you're going to see. He um, he is a prepper, okay? But it's still it's still all of, we're prepping for Jesus' second coming, are we not? We're just looking at it completely different. If there, some of these people are looking at it from a worldly perspective. We're looking at it knowing Jesus is coming again, and the time of trouble is going to be before Jesus comes. And when that time of trouble hits, we have to already know how to grow our food. We have to have already set up. It's not, Nan has a cousin, her husband is, a, um, he's kind of a prepper, and he's prepping for this great catastrophe, this economic crisis is coming upon the world, and uh, he's storing gold, okay? Uh, thousands of dollars worth of gold, he's storing. So, I said, uh, what about food? You can't eat gold. I'm telling you, you can't eat gold. And he goes, I've got, he showed me this. He said, I've got my box of seed. <laughs> it's all heirloom seed. I've got my box of seed. So when it happens, I can just put them in the dirt. <laughs> just like that, it's going to go wonderful. <laughs> no, we have to, in order to get ready for that great time of trouble that the Bible says is coming upon the whole world, we have, to, we have to start preparing now. We don't, we don't wait until the catastrophe hits. You start right now. So this guy that you're going to see, he, he is going to explain to you that he was a little bit, he was really didn't believe back to Eden worked. Okay? And he's going to show you a demonstration of what happened to him. There's a video that's been going around on the internet that's really been popular. As a matter of fact, a lot of my subscribers have recommended it to me. And Mrs. Wrangler Star and I watched it uh, probably a couple, I don't know, maybe I guess a year ago for the first time. And I'm really skeptical about uh, radical ideas or changes in things. Um, I'm kind of a believer of the wheel turns round and round and nothing is new under the sun and what was good then is good now. Oftentimes uh, we think that uh, the, the, the next thing that's going to improve our life radically is just around the corner or the next purchase and uh, rarely is that the case. Most of the time it's just uh, someone marketing, uh, trying to find a way to sell us something that we probably don't need. But uh, I took this uh, video to heart. It was called uh, Back to Eden. And this is a Christian guy who has uh, come upon a way through his study of the Bible uh, to garden uh, without using irrigation. And what he's doing is he's using wood chips. And how he's using the wood chips is he's putting the wood chips on the ground, and the wood chips are doing several things. Primarily, I believe, they're keeping the moisture in the soil. They're also preventing weeds from coming up. And he, on his video, if you watch it, I think it's, I'll put a link in the subject box down there if you're interested in it. I highly recommend you do it. It's an excellent video. Whether you're a, a person of faith or not, it doesn't make any difference. You'll enjoy it nonetheless. Um, what, what he's doing, um, I think... His results speak for themselves. So we uh, decided to uh, take a chance and to work, use this process in our garden that he's been using uh, with really good success. And I'll show you um, the differences uh, with the wood chips, without the wood chips, uh, how we're getting our wood chips, and a little bit of some of the work we've been doing around here as a side note uh, in preparation for wildfire which the two things work really hand in hand. As you're clearing your brush, as you're clearing the, the areas, making your, your house safer while safer from catching fire, uh, you're also able to generate this material uh, to wood chip your garden. Uh, so let's go into it. So as you can see, I've been standing here uh, about 75 by 100 area uh, for our garden. We started small, but we'll be expanding this. You know, the garden's not built overnight. It takes years and years. But you can see right here where we have the boxes and the areas that I've laid down the wood chips. We've put in, uh, we've chipped all these ourselves with our own chipper and just laid them on the ground. And I want to show you the difference in the ground between the place where we've laid the chips and the place we haven't. I'm just randomly going to pick a place in the garden where we have not put wood chips. And I want to, want to let you know that three months ago all of this dirt that you're looking at right here was uh, not only subsoiled and disked with a, with a large farm tractor, but it was also rototilled by me. It was soft and fluffy to about 12 inches down. Really nice soil. No one has driven on this. No one has really walked on it. Hasn't been any animals or anything on it. This is just how the soil has returned to its natural state. And if you watch this, I'll put my shovel in here. This ground is hard. You can't get 
a spade in it with all my 200 pounds of weight. I just won't go in. It's, it's hard as a rock. This is not ideal for growing in. Now let's go over and look at the soil that uh, we put the chips on. So here you can see we're in uh, the midst of the garden where we've put about four inches originally of the chips. What I've noticed is that as it's settled down and the greens have deteriorated, the chips uh, have uh, compacted to about uh, two inches. Now the other thing I've noticed is that there's, there's essentially no weeds have sprung up in here. And the weeds that do grow up, uh, because the soil is so moist underneath of it, are just simply pull up. You don't, uh, they don't break at the roots. But let me show you a, a comparison here. Just picking a random spot. Look how easy that spade went in there. How soft the soil is. And this is the soil that we walk on, that we compact with our feet uh, every day that we're in the garden. So I want you to take a look at this. I'm pick a pick a spot here. Pull these chips away. I guess there's more. Yeah, it's probably about three, maybe three inches there. But this is a uh, ground here. This is the end of summer, and you can see here the. Uh, Look at the dirt. Look at that in contrast to where the chips were, where I couldn't get the spade in. It's, uh, it stays moist all winter or all summer long. Okay, so you can see the benefit. I have uh, read studies where somebody had clay soil. I had somebody that had, uh, they had clay soil and they put the wood chips four inches thick on the top and soon they could plant in the clay with no problem. So these wood chips, now you think about it, when you go into an old growth forest, you have about this thick of a layer of that kind of stuff on top of the soil before you can ever get to it. And so what God has done is blanketed his earth with protection to protect his soil underneath from getting cooked by the sun, the microbes growing out, things turning off. And what, he, what we're doing here is we're cooperating with God, cooperating with him, setting it up the same system as an old growth forest. So, put your mic, uh, put your chips on it. Go to the, go to uh, now. I was going to tell you how to grow your own microbes. If you do a compost pile, you go into the forest like we studied last time. Hey, Carlitas, and and uh, you go in, Carlos. I mean, uh, you go into the soil. Uh, you go in and get your scent, uh, your humus, and you sprinkle on your soil and water it in. All you're doing is adding the microbiology to the soil. And, and it starts working. Nan and I uh, went to see when, when Joseph and Myra, my son and his, his wife and, and daughter, lived in Gainesville. We went to see them. And what, what we saw was uh, they said, well, why don't we go to a park here? Uh, you know, a city park in Gainesville. There, there's nothing to them. But what was interesting is they built this area and they put wood chips there so when the kids fall, they don't hurt themselves. So I took my foot and I dug down about three inches. It was black, rich. I said, oh man, they don't need to have a playground here. They need to have a garden here. <laughs> this would be perfect. So, what you do, put them down, let the microbes from the soil come up and start eating them. Make sure you drill your soils. Make sure you get your aerated holes in so everything is starting to flow. And put this stuff on it real, well, as thick as you can afford to do. Uh, rake it all out. Put you or a fence around it. You know, Paul... Uh, I was reading about how he started. He actually started, he, he set up his chicken coop, he put the stuff in there, and then he moved his chicken coop, and now he's got it all permanent. And he just takes the stuff from his chicken coop, uh, coop and he puts it on his soil. And he just keeps bringing it and bringing it. It gets richer and richer. And he plants the same thing over and over and over again in the same spot. You do not have to rotate crops if you do it this way. The microbiology kills all the pathogens. You don't have to worry about them coming back. Any diseases move from one crop to another. You just keep planting the same stuff in the same location over and over again. Let's go back to Back to Eden. I want to show you something in Back to Eden. Uh, oh, oh no, I want to show you this. This is a... Okay, so these 
small, we took the cover off. Put some store water. Now, has anybody been around chicken pen? Yeah. 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 They have they have a very distinct odor. Now this is not much at all. I want you all to really sit behind the scenes to the amazing passes and try to take in the odor here. <laughs> now I want you to see his principles of chicken. <laughs> There's lemon, lemons, rinds, there's avocado seeds, there's all my wood ashes over there. If you look at the, the grass outside, you see how much higher it is here? That's you see how, how short my fences are getting? I have to every year take out this stuff because they're making so much. You see, and I will have for the rest of my life everything my garden needs, and all I need is a wheelbarrow and a screen. All for my yard waste. I'm just telling you, this is what I so love about God. If you stop waking up and observing what He's given everything you need, you look at this gorgeous stuff in there. Look at how beautiful black it is. It's just rich. And these chickens are making from all look at see, my big old nasty you know, broccoli plants and stuff. All that comes in here and they turn it back into that gorgeous black stuff and I do no work. How come you don't smell it? Smell a strong manure smell. The reason there's no strong manure smell, everybody listen to me. Nothing in nature stinks. You can grow in the nature where you have huge flocks of birds and animals. There's no odor. None. God is an awesome God. He's good. He made nothing to stink. Nothing stinketh. When something stinks, it's a wake-up call that something is out of order. I'm just, and, and we, because we went to school, we have now adapted to and accept stench as normal and live with it. It's abnormal. It's wrong. It shouldn't be. And when something stinks, it's because the order is not in place. I'm just telling you, it's huge. What's is this a cougar? What's this? This is a cat. Oh, my. Oh, that's my cat. 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 You see how the chickens, how they're constantly digging and picking out? You see, they, they pick out every weed seed. They're constantly working the soil, you know, eat, completely turning it over. Turning it over. <laughs> or if you got these compost piles that you're turning and you do all this labor, these guys do it all for free. A way better job than you can. You know, and it's just it's just it's just so pathetic how we just don't connect, you know. And look at it, you know, eat, 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 eat that onion, you know, the look at look at the zucchini. Yeah, that's that's an onion. You don't feed them corn or, 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 or anything at all? Again, people ask me, aren't you feeding them grain? And I always ask, you ever see a pheasant in nature or wild turkeys? They're beautiful, right. gorgeous feathers. Who's feeding them grain? Who's feeding them corn? Excuse me? Who is feeding them that stuff? No one. They get some grain in the summer when the grass goes to seed, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Most of the year they're eating this, this. And you see, because we went to school and we're told they have to have that because they want to sell you that garbage, we believe it. But we don't look at nature. Nature's telling you just the opposite. And we don't believe it. So my chickens live fine year round on all my yard, all that kale out in the orchard, that's for my chickens all in. See, I raise everything here to support them, you know, as well as myself. And it's not hard, it's very easy. You know what's so interesting about your, your chick the chickens? The chickens will tell you. What is the most nutritious food to eat? See, all of nature is connected with God. They didn't disconnect. So I'm, I'm in my, I, I grow this lettuce, which is really nice. And lettuce seeds are small, so they come up too thick. So I'm thinning this lettuce. They sell in the store for like three, four bucks a pound. That really nice, tender stuff. And I go to my kale plants. I'm pulling off this kale, these really thick, old, ugly, heavy leaves. I throw my wheelbarrow. I got to my chickens, and I watch my chickens kick away that ten to three dollar pound stuff and start eating the kale. So I have to stand and say, okay, God, i got to watch this. And when they finish the kale, they eat the lettuce. And God says, they know what is the most nutritious. They get it. 
You know, I'm just telling you, if, and, and my dog, you saw them eating apples out there. If I go, buy, go to Costco and buy an apple, my dog will not eat it. Because she knows they're poisonous. The organic, you want to hear something scary? And here's the word that says in the end days, which we are in now, that they'll say what's wrong is right, and what's right is wrong. My wife went to the store one day and bought these organic carrots, those little small ones. And I gave one to my dog, and she wouldn't eat it. So I go to the owner and says, you know, my dog goes in my garden, she pulls carrots out all day long and eats them. And she won't eat organic carrots. What's up with this? And he got this sad look and he says, Paul, they raise them organically, but the producer sprays them for shelf life and you can feel the slime on them. Oh. <laughs> Your dog's picking up on that spray. Oh. They're labeled organic. People are buying them for clear conscience, thinking they're buying organic food and it's got this spray on them that my dog knows is toxic. Y'all getting the message? Does this, does this make sense to you guys? Okay, it, it makes sense to me. I, I don't think we need to uh, reinvent the wheel. If you want a garden like he has that really is lush and not full of weeds and easy to work, uh, why not just go ahead and cooperate with God? Put you down some wood chips, work them, do the static composting. You don't have to flip them and work them and temperature them and all that kind of stuff. And, and it just makes sense. Now I do static, I, I do the thermal composting and it works wonderful. It's absolutely a wonderful thing. It is work. Trust me, it is work. All right, now we have, we might have one more minute. I'm going to show you this and then we're going to call it a day. Um, we'll go back to the original. And when you look at the incredible landscape on planet Earth, all the different, this is just so opposite. You know, it makes it so simple. This is this is the most beautiful stuff you could ever, ever have. But you use a pesticide, whether it's organic or inorganic, or killing good um, insects as well as bad. For instance, when you have aphids and ladybugs coming right after to control them. And so my feeling is I don't want to kill them, I don't want to kill bees, and so I'll just live with the pests, you know, for that period of time. And um, it's not a problem. Those are potatoes. Crop rotation. If you look at nature, plants go to seed and the seeds fall on the ground. And they do it every year, decade after decade, century after century, and it's not a problem. But when you cultivate and you have exposed ground, you've got to move crops from you because you'll have, you'll have um, disease issues and, and problems, you know. I think I got the classic example down here in my pond area where it's a nice, good, low, wet spot. I've been growing potatoes now 16 years in a row in the same place, and they come out nice and clean every year. And then we're going to harvest some potatoes. And that's one of my favorite fun things to do because it's such a pleasant, you know, surface to be on. The potatoes come out so clean and nice, and it's just, it's just fun, you know. And as I'm harvesting, I'll also plant. And my harvesting and planting is all at the same time. It makes it so simple and easy. <laughs> this is um, wood shavings and horse manure mixed together. And it's just, guys, let's just look down here. As you dig, just how beautiful it gets. It's just, oh, this is like, you know, if any, any farmer or gardener would recognize it, this is, this is like ultimate gold. This is the most beautiful stuff you could ever, ever <coughs> Look at just how soft my hands I can do it. And it's just never never compacts, it's totally just the best. <laughs> see that this is last year's seed. See how it's hollowed all the way up inside. See it, let's see how much you know how oh, different that looks in that. That was a seed I planted last year. And if you know anything about growing potatoes, if you grow potatoes in dirt, if you don't rotate them, after several years they'll get scabby and that scab will increase to where you can't even use a potato. It gets so bad. But my potatoes down at the pond, the girls were here harvesting, they're all clean and beautiful, no scab. And I love it, it just makes it so convenient. Okay, that's it. So, um, now in the section on, P, on pH, the section on pH he covers, he said, you see this blueberry plant right here? It, it wants uh, 5.2 pH. Uh, this plant right here wants 7.8, but both of them are growing perfectly side by side together. When you work with nature, you don't have to fight those battles of pH and all of this, all this stuff. Cooperate with God. He'll cooperate with you. Don't fight nature. Work with nature. That's what this is all about. Grow with God. Okay? Um, that's it for today. Next week, uh, we're going to cover vermicomposting and compost teas and how to spray your plants to keep bugs away uh, naturally that doesn't hurt you. 
And how many people have worms, know where worms are? Earthworms. Earthworms. Do you have earthworms on your property? Okay, do you know where earthworms are? All right, next week I'm going to show you a trick on how to get them out of the ground without digging. It's a trick, let me tell you. It is a trick. No dig worms. All right. So uh, who would like to have our closing prayer? Anybody volunteer for our closing prayer? Pastor Ed, do you want to pray? Father, we thank you for the joy that is ours to be able to come and see you at work on a personal basis. These men that have trusted you and have taught and are teaching us now, may we take the wisdom that they have provided and apply it to our lives that we may serve thee better. Amen. Be with our church service this morning. Bless our speaker and our worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. After this gardening series, we're going to have, uh, the pastor wants to do some studies, uh, if you want to get in his Bible study group. But we're going to go probably two, maybe three more weeks, uh, and then we'll end it. And then uh, I would like to have you guys out on a tour of the farm. Right now we don't have a lot growing because we're taking everything out, getting ready for the fall garden. And then I'm going to go to Taiwan because my son's getting married. And then on the, when I get back, I'm going to start replanting everything. The time to see that facility is when there's plants in the ground, if you know what I mean. So 